always his nature to be good. I take this opportunity to thank each one of you for finding time to be here. May God bless you mightily. We have two psalm reading. The first one is Psalm number 34, verses number 18. The next is Psalm 147, verses 1 to 3. I start with the Psalm 34, verses 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and, serves and saves such as have a contrite spirit. 147, 1 to 3. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and the praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers together the outskirts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That is the word of God to us today.
here today. Really? It's so good to be here this morning. I'm so blessed by being in this church. It, it's my first time to be in this church. I want to take this opportunity to thank the senior ministers and all other ministers and the leaders of this church for bringing me forth to bring the word of God this Sunday. It's such a wonderful place to be. Let me get this off my chest. I like the worship team and the choir. You sing so nice. God bless you so much. I am Geoffrey Kiyoko. Um, I am a pastor. I became a pastor at the age of 18. Some people ask, how was that possible? I realized most of the things we have learned are just intellectual interventions, but the real thing is in your heart. And so in the course of time, I got prepared to help people, which I have done since 1999, to help people that are going through grief. And I want to talk about finishing your emotional journey well, because this is Joseph. And we know the story of Joseph. We just read. It says, you planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about present result. The survival or salvation of many people. How many of us know you were not created for yourself? God created you for a purpose. And everything you have is for other people. Whether it's ministry or business or a career, you offer it to other people. I found a good habit in my life. And I've come with a slogan that says, if you want to learn swimming, you learn swimming from a man who can swim. And I think this man's journey befits an investigation this morning. In the next 15 minutes, I'll give you some highlights, then we are going to pray about the life of Joseph and his brothers, and Joseph in Egypt, and Joseph in prison, and Joseph the prime minister. Joseph begins his life at home, the very first place in our lives where we are formed, the place where we are synchronized and projected to life. The place where we are mentored, the place where we are associated with customs and culture. It's a very important place to a point that almost 95% of who we are, what we believe and what we do is influenced by the very foundation we got in our home. If you look at, our, at, our, at your life, you will see many things that look like your childhood. If you are a child that was, or if you were a child that would be told no by your father or mother, and when you cried, you, they changed their mind and gave you what you really wanted, you grow up to be an adult who when they are told no, they will throw tantrums to try and get what they want. If your mom used to pick you up when you cried and pamper you and tell you, oh, stop crying, I'll buy you a cake or a sweet. You've grown up to be an adult who thinks that can, you can medi medicate bad feelings with food. That's why when you get angry, you eat a whole can of ice cream. We have been associated from home. If you look at the way you react to things, it's based on your first association with something since you were a child. Some of you actually, when you are arguing with your spouse, you stop arguing with your spouse, you either start arguing with your mother or your father in the process because you are synchronized to think about men or women in a certain way. The environment you grew up has influenced you a lot. And that's why the Bible says, Show the world, the, a child or teach a child a way in which they will grow or go. And when they grow up, they will not depart from it. There is a way sticking in your life. So we see Joseph 
in a phase I would want to call the routine phase. He's experiencing love. He's his father's favorite. He has, he has a coat of many colors. But you know, if you're a parent and you have a favorite child, you are not favoring that child. You are setting up that child for hatred. His brothers hated him because he was loved more by his father. So at routine phase, everything is normal. He's being showered with love. He's feeling good. We all go through these phases at one time or another or many times over. But we all know that when you are comfortable, your life cannot amount to anything because you lack the drive to desire change. And God brings a disturbance in Joseph's life and he, he, he gives him a dream something to awaken him. So he comes into a dreaming phase, phase number two, where you feel you need to do something, you don't know exactly what it is, and you don't know how you are going to accomplish it. And your emotions are worked up. You have a hope without a strategy, and you are trying to have a motivation that is not skill-based. And that's where most people crash. Because when you have a big dream, and you have hope without a strategy, you grow a sense of pride. You know, my background is in SEK and AIC, and I, got, I gave my life to Christ when people were being filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we got filled, we were so enthusiastic, we thought everybody else is not saved enough. We became so proud that we spoke in tongues professionally, just to irritate those who cannot speak. Other people here, God has given you a dream and you use that to poke the ribs of people who seem not to be doing well in your life. Some of you have been blessed with wealth and you use that to frustrate people who look like they are not doing well. It's a phase we go through in life, a dreaming phase. When your dream seems to be bigger and higher than everybody, you forget that your dream is about everybody. It's about the very people. So he told his dream to his brothers, and they hated him. I've heard some people even preach and say, if you have a dream from God, don't tell people. But I have wise counsel this morning. If you have a dream from God, tell everybody. They might sell you to your Egypt, where you will face problems and develop into a mature leader that can help them. Don't fear to speak out your dream. Expose your dreams. Let those who love you, love you. Let those who hate you, hate you. Because that's how life is. Because anyway, even if you don't tell them your dream, not everybody will like you. So they sold him to Egypt. The third phase of his life was a phase of separation. How do you deal with it? When your brothers, the very people who should be defending you, take you up and sell you to a slave dealer. It's painful. It's painful. He got separated with the people he was familiar with and with the people he had hoped will stand with him. As I said, I've been a pastor for 18 years and I know being a pastor is not about preaching a message. It's about learning to live with people. If you look at most churches, almost all churches, when a church member goes back to the world, the pastor does everything in his power to bring that member of the flock back. They do that. If you fall 20 times, your pastor will knock at your door 20 times. But I have learned Church members give a pastor only one chance. If there is a rumor that the pastor has done something wrong, everybody moves out. As if a man of God has one chance with God. So I know being a pastor is about being separated with some people. You face this crisis, you face that crisis. And it's not just being a pastor, just being anything a businessman, or a mother who employs maids. You know, it's about people coming in, 
getting attached to you and experiencing separation. And sometimes we don't know how to take that journey. Joseph experienced that. I know, I, I believe in miracles. And sometimes when someone has been through problems a lot of times, we think God, after one or two disappointments, should vindicate that man. But it's not the case with Joseph. After being separated, he goes into another vicious phase. I call it the betrayal phase. Where you've given all. And you have been faithful. And you have served. You have done all you could. But the very people you serve so faithfully stand up against you, accuse you falsely, and send you to an unpleasant place. The very employees who you, you've toiled to work your business to pay them, or your very boss, whom you've given your best accountancy skills to, believes a lie about you and sends you to jail. I came to realize some other day I visited committee, it's not all those people that are in there who have done anything to deserve to be there. But all I can say is, some people are there in God's plan, not necessarily because they committed a crime, but because God is doing something in their lives. So after the face of betrayal, Joseph goes into a face of isolation. I want to dwell there a little bit because that is where most of us find ourselves and that's where most people and most dreams have been killed and that's where most souls have fainted and lost hope. He's sent into prison, a place where you have minimum interaction. I've seen things posted all over. They say, when you are rich, people, you have many friends. But when you are poor, you are very friends depart from you. And I've always been asking myself, why do people like to write that? Then I realized, when you are rich, you don't need a lot of time to meditate. Because life is good. But when you are very poor, you need time alone to think critically, to analyze your life and get mad with yourself to do something. So it's not a wrong thing when your friends are isolated from you. When people run away from your life and you find yourself alone. You, you're probably in this big church and nobody has ever said hello to you and you think it is the devil. And no pastor has even recognized you in the church register and come to say you are a member. Thank you. How are you doing? It's not the devil. God is trying to work out something, even if it is the devil. Moments of isolation are moments of great break. Most people come to ask me how to succeed in business and in life, and I just tell them, you know, the key to succeeding in business is not about knowing business. It's about knowing how to cope with frustration and isolation. People think, well, being a millionaire is a good life. You have everything you want, but you don't have everybody you need. In isolation, he chose not to go into depression. He chose not to blame people. He chose not to blame circumstances and background and the church and the pastor. Oh, our pastor doesn't pray, pray for us well like the other church. All those are mere excuses. In prison, he realized in my moment of isolation, I will live my life at a higher synthesis. In my father's house, I used to interpret dreams. I used to dream dreams. Now I will start to interpret dreams. He got better in prison. There are problems that come into your life and they are supposed to be kicked out by prayer. There are some problems and issues that come into your life and they stick there to change you. And when their purpose has been accomplished and your life has been synchronized into God's purpose, they disappear and you are ushered into a new phase. I want to talk to someone who is hurting this morning. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. Because your kind of problem is that kind of a problem you don't trust anybody to tell. And especially us men, 
who are not supposed to cry, according to everybody's expectation, especially to us men who break on the inside until we turn violent with our families, especially us men who grow so bitter and do not know who to speak to, especially us men who can be in a fix, but because we are the leader, we have to fix other people and nobody is there to help us fix ourselves. Your isolation moment is an hour of concentration and not of letting go. You may be asking, why has my problem persisted? And some problems bring good tidings with them. When God spoke to Abraham, he told him, I'll make you a father of many nations. When God called Abraham and told him that, he was a pastoralist. And you know, you cannot run a nation by the capacity of a pastoralist. They needed to transform from pastoralists into nationalists. They needed to learn governance, architecture, building. And God prophesied Egypt. He said, your generation will be there for so many hundred years. And when those years are over, I will rescue them and take them to the place I prepared them for you. And he said, when those years were over, he sent Moses and he said, I have heard the cry of my people. Why would God take his people to a place where they would be crying? I will tell you why before I pray and close. Some things we face in our lives come to transform us. In Egypt, they learned architecture. In Egypt, they learned what it is to have boundaries. I don't mean this in a bad way. I grew up with the pastoralist community. They have no sense of boundaries. Where the grass is green, that's their territory. They had to learn what it means to have boundaries, have an army, protect their territory. They needed to learn what it really means to have an economy and govern and drive an economy. They needed to know what is leadership development. They needed to know what is protocol. They needed to learn all those things so that when they go into their promised land, they will not be confused on how to become a nation. This was land in Egypt. That is where Israel became a nation. I've listened to stories of su successful men, and most of them have been to the worst places in their life. But that worst place did not destroy them. That worst place built them. I want to implore all of us today to ask God to give us a new way of seeing with insight the things we are going through. And to reposition ourselves for the benefit of pain. Because... No pain is in vain. And when he finished his phase of isolation, he became a prime minister. I tend to think people think success is for significance. And that's where we miss it. Success is a place of responsibility. Not a place of significance. Every success you've had in your life is a test to help you show God who you really are. Joseph would have taken his position and gone to kill his brothers. And say, now they will know who I am. Do you know success brings a sense of arrogance? I've seen people as a pastor over these years, I've been a pastor for over 29 years, I've seen people come to church with nothing, grow up, become, have a lot, and God blesses them, then all of a sudden they decide that church is not my class. So which class is your class? 
because you came without class. I mean, success has a sense of arrogance. It can even change your walking style. And even if you've never been to school, you can find yourself speaking some English like, in fact, of course. And our pastor will be together in the spirit this weekend because we have a family meeting. Oh, all this, you know, it brings a sense of arrogance when you have a PhD or a, a breakthrough and you're greeting great men and you've made your way through. You know, you can do that. And I hear people say things, and I know if these people were successful, they will really hurt community. Because even when they pray, they say, God, bless me so that they may also know who they are. Someone ready to revenge on their enemies. I hear people say, may my enemies die. Then I know, oh God, this man can kill when they become successful. The Bible says, bless your enemies. Pray for them. Love them. But you see, when a pastor stands and says, your enemies will die this week. And you see congregation members there, hey amen. You find there is a problem. It's an emotional problem in the hearts of men. They are not seeking God, they are seeking revenge. Joseph should have revenged, but he stood and says, I know you guys are evil. But look at where your evil intentions have brought me into God's good intentions. I want to close this message by saying no matter what you are facing, no matter the intentions of those that are provoking you, you are going to come to God's good intentions. You may not understand what is happening. You may not know why you miscarried that child or you lost that child as a, at a tender age. You may not know why that business went down. You may not know why you got divorced and every other woman in the church thinks you are trying to snatch their husband. You know, people in church can be weird and you, live, you feel isolated. You don't know why you are widowed at this age. You, you, you may not explain all these things. I want to promise you, I cannot explain either. But one thing I know, in the days of your life, before you come to the end of your emotional journey, you will stand like Joseph and say, all this harvest of evil intentions have brought me into a place of God's good intentions. If we trust in God, if we believe in God, if we love God, if we focus ourselves on God, every betrayal, every isolation, every separation, every hatred people have projected on you, if you can use the tools with God granting us an opportunity, I will give you, you will be able to sail through. I want to give you just one tool. It's called forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is giving up the hope of a better or different yesterday. I repeat again. Forgiveness is giving up the hope of a better or different yesterday. It's saying what happened has happened. I have no power to change it. I only have the power to change myself and put myself into a new path towards my destiny. Forgiveness does not benefit the person being forgiven. It benefits the forgiver. I want to say something about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an emotion or a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice. Ever heard someone say, I want to forgive, but I feel my heart is not yet there? Your heart will never be there. It's a conscious choice you make. Have you ever tried to wake up one morning, you feel like not going to the office, and then you decide, anyway, I will go and let my feelings follow me in the office, and by noon, you are having a blast in your office? That's how forgiveness is like. You choose to forgive no matter what. He knew these men were evil. He did not make an excuse for them. Don't always make excuses for people. Tell them point blank. You intended to hurt me. I have forgiven you. But look what the Lord has done. 
and thank them for being the school masters of your success. Because if they never hated you, you would not be where you are. If they never left you, you would not be where you are. And when you forgive and let go, you position your life for better health. You give your mind space for better judgment and decision making. And your life's quality begins to improve. I want to give you an illustration and pray today. If I was walking with someone who I hate so much, I mean real hatred, and we go to a place with pool, a pool full of crocodiles, and I want that person to die, and I push him into that pool with crocodiles, and you are watching him. Will you just be quiet? What will you tell him? To get out of the pool, isn't it? Because the pool is a dangerous place. Otherwise, the crocodiles will eat him. Suppose that person looks back at you and tells you, you guys are telling me to swim out of here. Do you know, are you aware that I did not push myself inside here? I'm going to wait until the person who pushed me inside here comes to get me out. That is the folly of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will give you diseases, will shut down your organs, will impede your judgment. That's why when you talk to a person you have not forgiven, you shout and they are only one meter away. You lack judgment. You think they are a kilometer away. I mean, unforgiveness makes you so bitter, you lose judgment. You even eat too much. You can't tell when your stomach is full or you can't tell when it's lunchtime you don't eat and you are mad with every man and you say, well, all men are the same. All, all women are the same. You judge the whole world around you based on that one experience. You even look for preachers and the scriptures that fit your crisis and, and their songs and the hymns that really fit your crisis and unforgiveness can control your life. If you're a preacher like me, you preach people. You preach people. I, I listen to someone trying to preach. He said, my message for today is people are bad. And he had a scripture after scripture of showing how people are bad. I don't know. That may be true. But people are bad. But God is is good. God is good. Forgive. Forgive your past. Forgive people. Forgive events. Let go your frustrations. If your father never had things, don't look for success because you come from a poor family. Just look for success because you need it. If, if, if you were hurt by somebody, young people, if you have had one or two or three break, breakups, stop judging and say, nowadays there are no people you can get married to. They are there. There are weddings every weekend. Wake up to reality and say, I've had four breakups. I'm going to, to take steps and process that. And I'm going to get to the fifth relationship. And soon you will see my wedding. Forgive, 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 forgive everything tying you from your brighter future. And I will promise you one thing before I finish, that you will get to the climax of your destiny. You will become a prime minister in your situation. Even the king will listen to your word. God will make you like a god to Pharaoh or to your situation. And your life will begin to turn around. Your tears will be turned into joy. Your tears will be turned into joy. Forgive, forgive, forgive. I feel the Lord saying as I close this service, learn to forgive. The people you did not forgive are not suffering. It's you suffering. I want to ask you a question. Since you were offended by that man, who is the one who is not eating? You or him? The guy is 
and mounting his ugali. He's just having good life. That sweetheart who left you, he got another sweetheart. And he's moved on with their life. Who is remaining looking at the pictures? And wishing them death. You know, they say unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Who is not having good night's sleep? Who sees men? And when they stretch their hands, they, you feel a potato come to your throat. It's not the one who did the wrong thing. It is the one who was wronged. I want to ask a question. Is it fair that someone wrongs you and you have a bad life because they wronged you and you have high blood pressure, you develop diabetes, you develop depression and stress and ruin all your relationship because one human being did something wrong. The Lord is saying free yourself. Free yourself. Free yourself from that kind of bondage and just decide no matter what they did to me, one, I forgive them. If your feelings tell you you can't forgive, tell them, feelings, it's a choice. I'm not waiting to feel. I'm deciding before I feel. And when you wake up every morning and the devil reminds you of that person, say, devil, I remember. Thank you for reminding me. I forgave them, I blessed them, and I love them in the name of Jesus because I am free. Fight for your freedom. Stick it out with the enemy. It's never going to come by people pitying you. Stand up for yourself. Govern your reactions. You have only one person you are in charge of over in your life. And that person is you. You cannot change what people do to you. But you can choose how you react to what they do to you. And this morning as a born again believer, the Bible gives us guidelines on what to do. And one of the guidelines is forgive. It's a good place to start. It's a good place to start.